Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, as it were, virtually. Um, and um, I'm going to be talking about uh, reconnection. Uh, I think we can just go to the next slide and recall uh, what has been recalled many times in this meeting that uh, Lord Kelvin had a theory of vortex atoms. I'll go quickly through this. I won't bother you with it again. Uh, next slide, some vortex atom pictures. Next slide. Uh, you might be interested in this picture. This is from the same period as Kelvin's work um, and is a vortex atom that was drawn by the mystics uh, Ledbetter and Besant, who had their own ideas about the role of knots in uh, metaphysics. Next slide. Um, and then here is a later um, image uh, related to Kelvin, which I've always thought was very interesting, a paper by Herbert Yela um uh in the, from the 1970s entitled flux quantization and particle physics and yela had the idea uh similar to kelvin um that uh elementary particles were quantized knotted flux and of course uh there have been many uh uh investigations that are actually rather similar to this since that time and Kelvin's idea hasn't died, uh, even if the luminiferous ether did kind of pass away. Next slide. Um, around 2012, Kleckner and Irvine uh, produced actual knotted vortices in water. And this has been an inspiration to many of us ever since. Uh, next slide. Their method was to use a template uh, which uh, whose cross section is a teardrop, as you see, so that if this teardrop moves through a fluid, there will be vortexing up at the upper peak of the teardrop, and that peak is rotated around to form a uh, template. And if you have an unknotted template and you move it quickly down through water, uh, then you will get a vortex line, a, a, a closed vortex line coming out above it. And if you knot the template, next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, if you use a knotted template, uh, then they discovered by or by working with these templates uh, uh, using 3D printing that they could actually produce knots. Uh, next slide. Uh, here is a, a, a picture of the template that's unknotted. And next slide. I'm not doing movies here. Yeah, uh, when you pull it down through, you get a uh, vortex. Sorry, um, you get uh, an unknotted vortex. Next slide. And here's the knotted template. And when it gets pulled down, next slide. There's their knotted vortex. And these knotted vortices uh, tend to disintegrate very rapidly. And we're concerned here with how disintegration occurs. Next slide. So, um, what what happens uh, to the one of the things that happens to these vortices is the reconnection. And here's a picture of reconnection scenario. Um, you have two vortex lines that are near one another, and then they undergo some complicated interaction and end up reconnected afterwards. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, um, we worked on, on this sum in a paper, uh, next slide, um, using the Gross-Piatewski model, next slide, next slide, I won't bother you with the definition of the model, but um, this kind of evolution produces very interesting pictures that can be, uh, can be examined. So for example, here's an initial trefoil, next slide, and then Here's the initial trefoil, just some shots of the evolution. Next slide. Next slide. And now you see the reconnection scenario beginning to happen in the case of this film uh, simultaneously in three places. Next slide. And now the reconnection has occurred and it's become two loops. Um, so, uh, so that's a very interesting um, method for modeling. Next slide. Um, now, 
let's talk about abstractly modeling reconnection. You you have a uh, a vortex, and I've indicated here the line of the vortex vertically here in the upper left hand part of the slide, and then the circulation around the vortex line by the little circle. And um, in order for them to interact, uh, and I'm using the right hand rule to, to, to describe an orientation for the vortex line in relation to the circulation around it. And then you'll notice that the vortex lines need be um, oppositely oriented in order for the circulations to enforce one another in the space between them. And that's the condition under which the reconnection can happen and sometimes does. So that's going to be then the model, uh, either in three-dimensional space, you want to think of two lines that are basically coming in parallel to one another and undergoing a reconnection. It means that um, you're doing a, a little surgery on the lines and I'm not, I'm not changing any crossing numbers or anything of that kind. And in fact, if there was a crossing, as you see in the middle of the slide, then we're thinking of those two lines, one is coming into the crossing and the other is going out of the crossing as moving up and becoming parallel and undergoing the reconnection, the curl in the line remains there. The crossing remains, the reconnection has occurred. The writhe has not changed either diagrammatically or in space when you're thinking of it modeling this way. So when I speak of a reconnection, I mean a reconnection of this kind that is a local surgery and I am not changing the writhe. Uh, then if we went to the knot and looked at it, you see that at uh, we, there are at every crossing some reconnections available. So I did a reconnection at this crossing and I end up with a huff link and then I did a reconnection at the other crossing and I end up with an unknotted trefoil and you'll notice that the writhe has not changed but we have gotten to an unknot. The question then is thinking of reconnection in this way, how many reconnections do you need in order to undo a knot? Um, in this case, you see in the trefoil intuitively that doing one gets you two components and they're linked, and you're going to have to do another in order to get it to be unlinked. Next slide. So as I, this repeats what I said, that we model the reconnection by local surgery. And I think of this as an oriented saddle point transition. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Next slide. Um, this is a picture of, um, of those kinds of experiments that I was telling you about earlier. And let's just go to the next slide. I had a movie, but I'm not worrying you about the movie. Next slide. Um, and, um, and in this case, what happened is you start with the knot 6-2. This is just some uh, phenomenology now. Here you start with the knot 6-2, and you find that you go through a reconnection, and you end up with a link. And then uh, you take that link and you go through another reconnection and you end up with a truffle knot. And then, of course, you can undo the truffle knot in two more reconnections. So that makes for one, two uh, to get to the truffle knot. And then three, four, it appears that you use four reconnections to undo the six, two in this way of looking at it. Um, so in general, one can ask, well, might there have been a simpler way, or is this the simplest way given the physical situation? Next slide. Um, so as I said, I want to think of the reconnection as a saddle transition. And what I mean by that is I am thinking of the world line of the vortex. So the arrow is time. And as time goes on, the, uh, the reconnection event happens and you trace out a surface in four dimensional space, embedded in four dimensional space. And so I wish to think of this in that context. And I will also add, not for the physics, but for the mathematics, but maybe some part of the physics could come in. I'm adding births and deaths of circles that are unknotted. So this is what we usually do when we think of cobordisms of knots. We think of a world line, which is being traced by a knot, which undergoes the process of reconnection and also births and deaths of circles. And you consider the genus of the surfaces that are so produced in force space. 
Next slide, please. So um, the world line that we were looking at in the case of the truffle knot, now time is going down the page, consisted in single circle for the truffle knot going through uh, one saddle point, giving us the link of two components, and then one more saddle point, and we ended up uh, with an unknot. So this is a cobordism between the truffle knot and an unknot. And this world line has a genus one, it's a torus. Uh, and you see that every time you did a reconnection, you did a saddle, and that in order to get a hole, in order to get genus in the surface, you needed to have two reconnections, at least, in order to get the hole. So we can see the relationship between genus and reconnection. Next slide. Um, so this is um, this is the picture of the of the moves that happened on the six two over there in the lower left crossing that was a reconnection became a link and then that link went, underwent a reconnection at a crossing up on the upper right and it became a truffle knot and then two more took it down to an on knot. Um, next slide. Now I want to make a mathematician's comment, which could be compared with things that happen physically. Suppose you're thinking about a knot and you want to simplify it. Well, then you can switch crossings to simplify it. But switching a crossing, how many reconnections does it take to switch a crossing? And the answer is it takes two reconnections to switch a crossing. And I've indicated how to do that here by putting a little twist, do a little isotopy to get a little twist near the crossing. And now you have a, a, an arrow going down next to an arrow going up in the upper left next to saddle in that picture. And now it undergoes a saddle, it undergoes a reconnection. And you see that there is now a bit of rope that can be pulled out and then back over. So from under, to back over is an isotopy, and then go through a saddle again, two saddles, two reconnections, and you ended up switching the crossing. You'll notice that I haven't changed the ride, but I switched the crossing. Um, so it can be done. Uh, on the other hand, that doesn't look like it's the sort of thing that was happening in our evolutions, and indeed it isn't exactly, but we could ask whether there might be evolutions where something like that could happen. If it were the case, then some things could happen more efficiently. Next slide. Um, um, this slide is just indicating how I could orchestrate the truffle reconnection by doing crossing switches. And that's just for recreation. And I won't ask you to read it more carefully. Next slide. Uh, but here's 6.2 again. And 6.2 has an interesting property. It's a knot of uncrossing number one. You can switch one crossing and it becomes unknotted. I've illustrated that. Do you see the crossing that got switched? It's the one right in the middle. Um, and once it's switched, it's unknotted. So that means that you can undo 6-2 in only two reconnections if you had the ability to do the reconnections in exactly that order that I showed you. Next slide, please. Um, here, for example, is an imaginary scenario. The guy on the left is 6'2". I put a little curl in there, underwent a reconnection, um, and, then it, uh, and then it slid and went back under and went, underwent a reconnection, and it's unknotted. So two reconnections can undo 6'2". We could ask whether there's a physical situation in which 6'2 would be undone by two reconnections. Next slide, please. So we've seen that the physical sequence of reconnections that take six two to the unknot in four steps, but in principle, it can be done in two, and uh, more experiments could be done. Next slide. Now, what about lower bounds and actual bounds and calculations for reconnection number? Let's see what we can do. I want to let R of K be equal to the least number of reconnections needed to transform an odd K to a collection of unknotted circles, unlinked circles. And I mean by that in any way, right, up to isotopy of the knot. So you don't have to have the knot in some particular form. 
Um, you're allowed to do isotopy on it, and then sometime when you feel like it, do a reconnection. There's no physical constraint here. Um, and so that's a topological invariant of the knot and a number we would like to know. What's the least possible number of reconnections needed? Well, one invariant that will handle this is the, uh, they give you in a lower bound is the classical signature of the knot. And this is configured in some other talks as well here. The signature of the trefo is minus two and the signature of six two is also minus two, for example. Le next slide. Um, um, the the absolute value of the signature is less than or equal to the reconnection number. It's a lower bound. And um, the reason for that is that twice the genus in the four ball of the knot is certainly less than or equal to the reconnection number. As we had said, every time you could pick up a genus, you needed two reconnections. And the signature turns out to be less than or equal to twice the four ball genus which is a fact of classical knot theory from the work of Murasugi. So that tells us that the signature is a lower bound and we can use that. That's a good, um, good number. Um, next slide. Um, this is about the definition of the signature, but let's skip that. Next slide. Um, I want to talk about the cipher surface. This is um, really important. How much information can you understand about reconnection from the cipher surface? So let's just go back and do a little knot theory. Given any knot whatsoever, if you draw a diagram for it, then you can smooth all the crossings, which means that you cut them out and reconnect them, but that's a different use of the word reconnect, so that the crossing isn't there, as I've indicated on the right and you form a collection of cipher circuits or cipher circles in the plane. And then Seifert's method was to bound each one of those circles with a disk. And if they happen to be nested and so on, you can make the disks in upper, in upper three space, nested with one another and going upward in three space to make sure they're all disjoint. And then back at the crossings, you put them back in with a little twisted band and you find that the resulting surface is an orientable surface that bounds the knot. Quite useful for lots of things in knot theory. So that's the usual ciphered algorithm. Uh, next slide. Now I want to show you the ciphered algorithm appearing in the guise of reconnection. Here's the truffle knot again. And at each of the crossings, I've done one of those saddle transitions, one of those reconnections at the crossing. Um, and you see that when you do that, you actually cut it apart into cipher circles with some curliness on them because we're keeping the ride. So if you do a one saddle point reconnection, one reconnection at every crossing in the diagram, you'll be looking at the cipher circles, a curly picture of the cipher circles. So that's an observation for us and shows us some relationship between reconnection and cipher surface. Next slide. Now, here is a lemma about the genus of the cipher surface. If you have a classical knot diagram and it has C of K crossings and it has S of K cipher circles, then the genus of the cipher surface that I just described to you is one half of the number of crossings minus the number of cipher circles plus one. I won't prove it, but let's um, let's look at, uh, but it's proved easily by using the Euler formula, and you probably know this formula, but it, maybe it's easy to forget. We want the actual formula. Uh, so look at the cipher surface for the truffle knot there. It's not hard to see it's of genus one. It's a torus, um, punctured torus. And um, how many crossings do we have? Three. And how many cipher circles did we have? Two. So three minus two is one and one is two and divide by two and you get one. The genus is one. So there you have it. That's the formula for the genus of the cipher circle surface. Next slide. Um, so here's the theorem. Um, the four ball genus, twice the four ball genus is a lower bound on the reconnection number as we said. And if you put in signature and keep track of components, then you get an inequality involving the number of components of the link as well. I don't want to bother you with that. 
But um, the next part is uh, um, important. So I'm going to talk about positive links. And positive links means that every crossing is a positive type. Now, um, I don't want to go back a slide and show you a positive crossing, but the positive crossing, since all our crossings are oriented, is a crossing so that if you were to put your the fingers of your right hand in the over crossing direction and curl around, your thumb would point in the direction of the under crossing line. So that's a standard positive crossing for me anyway. And now we have the following result, that if you have a positive link, then the four ball genus of that link is equal to the cipher genus for any positive diagram of the knot. This is, uh, follows from the work of Rasmussen, Rasmussen's invariant. And I will come back near the end of the talk and sketch how this result is the result of thinking about Jones polynomial and Corbana homology. But um, what does that mean? That means that the reconnection number is greater than or equal to twice the four ball genus. And twice the four ball genus is the number of crossings minus the number of ciphered circles plus one by the theorem, because that's the genus of the ciphered surface, which is equal to the genus. So we have a, a, a definite computable diagrammatic lower bound for positive knots. Lots of knots are po can be taken to be positive. For example, any torus knot could be taken to be the positive one that you're looking at. And there are lots of positive knots. Um, so as I say, that's for us, that follows from, from Rasmussen. Next slide. But now we get uh, oh, I've repeated it, uh, and I've repeated the uh, idea that I will talk about how that comes about. Next slide. Okay, so here's the actual result. If you have a positive link, then the reconnection number is in fact exactly equal to C of K minus S of K plus one. Now we already know that it's greater than or equal to that, so it suffices to give a sequence of reconnections of exactly that many that undo it. And if we do that, then we get equality. And that means that we have a handy formula for the actual reconnection number of uh, an infinite class of knots and links that may be worth experimenting with. So that's my main message here, uh, that we have this specific formula. So let's see how to do that. All we have to do, given that we believe Rasmussen, is manage to undo it in exactly that number of moves. Next slide, please. So here is an example. Here's some positive knot over here. And now you see what I mean by positive crossings. If you check, you'll see that every crossing in this guy is positive. And then I have written the ciphered circles over on the right. I've smoothed all the crossings. But now, um, uh, as we've said, that would undo it, but it's too many reconnections. I did one reconnection for every crossing, there are 10 crossings here, um, but that was very inefficient. And what would be a better way to get down to an unknot would be to not do it at the dotted lines that you're looking at in the right-hand picture. They form a little chain if you reconnect, if you put the crossings back at every at each of the little dotted lines, you would get a loop that looks like the one below, which is certainly unknotted. It's just taking these cipher circles and chaining them together. So therefore, we should not do the dotted lines. How many dotted lines are there? One less than the number of ciphered circles, right? I have one, two, three, four dotted lines. I have one, two, three, four, five ciphered circles. In order to chain them all together, I needed to have them connected together by five sites. So I need to not do S of K minus one reconnections. So the number of reconnections that I am doing is the number of crossings minus the number of ciphered circles minus one, which is C of K minus S of K plus one, the number we were after. And so you see, this is uh, what I was claiming. 
that I, and I can always do this. So I just take any diagram, doesn't even have to be a positive diagram. I can always do that exactly that many reconnections on the diagram and get it to be unknotted. So in this case, the reconnection number is, is six. So that that's the other side of, of Rasmussen's result that we can do it. And, and given that we know that the reconnection number for a positive knot is given by that formula. Next slide, please. Um, here's a couple more examples. Here's a link. Um, the number of crossings is four. The number of ciphered circles is three. The R by my computation is two. Um, and indeed, you can see how to do it in two over there on the right. On the other hand, you might naturally try doing something else like you might do a reconnection on the middle circle with itself. And then you get two hop links and you still need reconnections on them. So you would have three. So different pathways will give you different results. And some of those pathways might come up physically, even though they aren't the most efficient pathway. So um, lots of examples to think about here. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the torus knot situation. Um, we have a torus knot of type PQ. Here, P is four and Q is three. Um, and uh, the crossing number of the torus knot is Q minus one times P. In this case, two is three minus one times four. Um, and you get that many crossings. And the cipher circles, there are Q of them. In this case, three cipher circles illustrated below. And, and we see that um, if we calculate C of K minus S of K plus one, um, then we're going to be getting Q minus one times P minus Q um, plus one and factor that out and you get P minus one times Q minus one. So that's the reconnection number for a torus knot. It's P minus one times Q minus one. And this parallels the Rasmussen result that the cipher genus which is P minus one times Q minus one over two is equal to the four ball genus in the case of the torus knot. That by the way, was a conjecture of Milner's long ago and then proved by Kronheimer and Moravka by using gauge theory and other techniques and then reproved by Rasmussen using combinatorial topology and Kovanov invariant. So that our, our material connects with that. Next slide. Um, not all reconnections lead to the production of genus, of course. Here's a slice knot, and I only need one reconnection. The if I went to the middle of it and just did a reconnection between the edges, it would fall apart. So um, that means that, um, next slide, um, uh, you could have reconnection number one. Here it's another slice knot, um, but the uncrossing number um, happens to be one. Um, so it's, uh, but twice the uncrossing number is what we would be looking at to get a bound on reconnection. Remember, every crossing switch requires two reconnections. So we're getting a reconnection number that's less than the estimate we would have gotten from uncrossing. And that can happen with wider inequalities. Uh, next slide. Um, a comment on the cascades. Since we know for a positive knot that the reconnection number is given by formula, you can start with a positive diagram and then enumerate all the cascades with some combinatorial restrictions. Just look combinatorially and, and, and uh, make comparisons with some of the cascades that are known. Um, uh, that's a great exercise and an infinite exercise and it is to be done. Um, so I just mention it. Uh, next slide. So since we know the reconnection numbers for positive knots, it should eventually be helpful in doing experiments. I hope so. Next slide. Um, now I want to talk to you about Kovana homology a bit. And um, let's see, I'm assuming more or less that we started at nine and that we have about 20 minutes left. Is that a reasonable assumption? Yes. About 20 minutes left? Yes. Okay, good. So, 
So let's, uh, I, d I thought I would spend a little time talking about how the Kavana phomology works in case you're interested in it and you haven't seen it before. Probably many of you have thought about it. Uh, here we're looking at a truffle knot and then we're looking at all of the smoothings of it that correspond to the states of the bracket polynomial. And Kovanov said, well, it's a category. Or he said, look, that's a big structure. Uh, and you can, you can think of it as an ordered structure because we could say we, that we will put an arrow between two states if we smooth from an A-type smoothing to a B-type smoothing, um, where the A-type smoothing and the B-type smoothing are defined by the bracket, probably in the next slide. And, and so you get this ordered structure with arrows uh, with loci in it, and that's a category, right? Um, and maybe by thinking in terms of categories, we can get deeper invariants than we could by just computing the Jones polynomial or the bracket polynomial. Well, um, he succeeds in this, and I want to tell you a little bit about the story of that without all the details, and then how Rasmussen used it. So let's go to the next slide. Um, here's a related category. Uh, this is the abstraction of the kind of category we were looking at a moment ago. In fact, I'm going to ask you to go backward in a moment. But look at this little category. This category is the category associated with a cube. If you were to divide a cube, which has side A and B, um, into parallelopipeds um, uh, that correspond to A plus B quantity cubed, then you would have a bunch of little cubes and rectangles all intercalcated with one another. The, the, a, the threefold A cube in the upper left-hand corner would be uh, attached by an arrow to one that was B by A by A, and so on. So you would get a cube category associated to a cube with a division of its edge length is a cube category. You can think of it as a categorification, a making into a category of the binomial A plus B cubed. A arrow B cubed is the cube category. Now, go back a slide, if you would. And you see that this is exactly what we were looking at, although it's been rotated by 90 degrees. Up there at the top, we have triple A, and then we have two A's and a B, and then we have two B's and an A, and finally we have three B's. Next slide. And uh, that's exactly what we have here. So we're looking at a cube category in back of the states of the knot. So the states of the knot superimpose on a cube on a cube category or an n cube category if it were, had more crossings. And um, and and then uh, one can use the structure of the cube category in back of the extra structure of the knot to define a chain complex and get a homology theory, and that's what Kovanov does. And it is related to general ideas in category theory of associating homologies to categories. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I remind you about the bracket polynomial and the A smoothing and the B smoothing, which I've labeled A inverse here because that's how you calculate the bracket polynomial. It also is worth remarking that um, the bracket polynomial is an unoriented reconnection process. You're looking at both reconnections. So you might think, well, that's not going to help me with oriented reconnection. But eventually it does help uh, by way of the line that I'm talking about. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so there's the Kovanov category again. Next slide, please. And now here's the way in which things are going to happen. There are maps from one state to another, and if you think about the structure of them, when you re-smooth an A, you may go from one component to two, or you may go from two components to one. And the Kovanov idea is that you associate a module to each of the circles in the states, and then there should be a map from one module to the next when you do a re-smoothing. So, that means there should be a map from the module to the tensor product of the module with itself corresponding to getting from one circle to two and there should be a map from the tensor product of the module with itself over to the module 
uh, when you're going the other way. Call one co-multiplication and the other one multiplication and assemble them into a boundary map for a chain complex somehow. Well, how? Next slide, please. Um, it turns out that you can do it with a very simple algebra. You can have an algebra which is generated by one and x, and um, x squared is zero. So that's about as simple an algebra as you could bump into. Uh, and then we're going to have the elements of the module are going to be circles, state circles, with label x or one. So that means x in the module corresponding to the circle, and one means one in the module corresponding to the circle, and a labeled circle is, in fact, an element of the module. It could be labeled one plus x as well, but we're thinking of the simplest labels, one and x. And then the coproduct on x is just the tensor product of x with x. That means that if we went from one circle to two, you would have each of the circles labeled with x. And the coproduct of one is a little more complicated. It's one tensor x plus x tensor one. And x squared is zero, as I said. So one labeled circle would go to two circles, but a linear combination of them, one tensor x and x tensor one. And that that is the algebra that actually works for Kovanov's method to get the boundary maps. Next slide, please. So, um, so I've told you what the boundary maps look like. And now I'm going to tell you how it interfaces with the Jones polynomial for a moment or two. Um, this is a, this is flying high over the structure of this thing. And um, I hope you don't get confused by it. On the other hand, it is a, 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 um, a decent enough summary in case you wanted to go further. So anyway, here's the, here's the bracket polynomial, but it turns out for purposes of keeping track of things, to be better to rewrite it instead of A and A inverse as one and minus Q, and then have the value of the loop be Q plus Q inverse. That's a rewrite, and you can still normalize it to get the Jones polynomial by an appropriate count of plus and minus crossings. And then we're going to label the states, and I label them abstractly with plus and minus. But I already told you why I wanted to label them. I wanted to label them with one and x. And x is going to correspond to minus one and one is correspond to plus. And then you see the value of the loop is q plus q inverse. So that means that I'm adding up the different labelings of the states. And if I do that, I can re-express the bracket as a sum of monomials. So this is going from the bracket toward the chain complex. Just wanted to show you how it looks. If you, re if you rewrote the bracket that way, it would be a sum of monomials, and you would get plus or minus q to some power. And then you say, well, what would be the sign and what would be the power? Well, the q comes in either from a loop with a plus or minus, uh, or a, in the first power from a b-type smoothing. So you see that j has got to be the number of b-type smoothings plus the number of pluses minus the number of minuses on the loops in the state. So that's a combinatorial thing. You can write it down for each state. And the minus one is equal to the number of B smoothings because that's the only place where a sign happened is when you went to a B smoothing. So you see you get that. But then you could rewrite it as the sum on IJ possibilities, minus one to the IQ to the J times the number of them. And I will I will put the the what the states that have the same i and j all together into one module. That turns out to be the chain complex. So next slide, please. So we have that, and that turns out to be the chain complex. And uh, and then I may or may not have put in a slide that tells you how the boundary works. But the boundary works in a beautiful way. Namely, it takes the Cij to the Ci plus 1j. J remains fixed, and the boundary goes up. But, it, you know, it has to change. It changes by 1, goes up. It's not really cohomology, but the boundary goes up from i to i plus 1. Um, and uh, that's with the way the boundary works. And it all fits into the, into the original bracket expansion in such a way 
than an appropriately defined Euler characteristic of the homology gives you the bracket polynomial, gives you the Jones polynomial. So that's the way it looks down there on the ground. Next slide. Uh, oh, I even wrote it out. You see, you could rewrite and collect the terms, and then you see that the, the sum of dimensions looks like an Euler characteristic. And the boundary, as I said, goes from i to i plus 1, and j is fixed, and you get that you get a sum of coefficients times the Euler characteristics of the homology. So the coefficients of the Jones polynomial are the Euler characteristics of this homology. And there's one homology group for each J. Got a lot of homology groups there. Okay, next slide. So that's the categorification. Now, uh, as I say, Rasmussen arises from a, com oh, I didn't say, but this is the interesting part of the story. The Rasmussen invariant arises from a comparison between two homology theories. There's another one lurking in there that can be constructed in the same way. Next slide, please. It turns out that the algebra that we were talking about can be expanded a little bit and still work. Um, you do the same tricks with the algebra, co-product, product, but you don't have to have x squared equal to zero. You can have x squared equal to a constant and you'll still get a homology theory. And you can choose the constant to be whatever you like. So the extremes that we're interested in is zero, that's the original Kovanov, and interfaces with the Jones polynomial, and one, which is Lee's homology, invented by Yun Su Li. Um, and at k equals one, it's a little bit different algebra, uh, but it still gives you a Kovanov homology. Uh, it gives you a homology, it's not Kovanov homology. Next slide, please. Lee's algebra looks like this, x squared equals one, and the coproduct and the product are like that with an extra term, see? x tensor x and one tensor one, not, not zero. And then what happens is that Lee's algebra, it's easier to pinpoint what the cycles are. You'll see in a moment why. But the grading j that we had before is not preserved uh, uh, under the boundary. And so you have to look at the way the grading behaves when you compare cycles in Lee homology with cycles in Kovanov homology. And that's what Rasmussen did. He, he said, okay, I can, I can compare one homology theory with the other. It's easier for me to understand cycles in one, and I can get bounding results by looking at the way they interact with one another. So it's a bit of algebraic topology to get this all working. Next slide, please. Lee's algebra can be rewritten in a cute way, um, an exercise for you if you cared to copy the slide. You let r be one plus x over two and g be one minus x over two. And then you'll find that um, rg is equal to zero. And uh, the deltas are easy. They look like just tensor products of r's with themselves. This is good because you want to label states with, with elements Next slide, please. So then what happens is the following, that if you take a knot diagram and you take its ciphered circles, which of course is one of the states, you can alternately label the, the ciphered circles red and green. And that makes the cycle because of the fact that ciphered circles don't touch themselves. And so all of the all of the boundary maps on that are multiplications and red times green is zero. So you're looking at a cycle that you can construct in the Lee homology. And the Lee homology cycles are directly related to the cipher decompositions of the knot. And it's out of that and the comparison that one is able to get these results about the genus being equal to the cipher surface genus and so on. So I hope that gives you a little idea about how Lee homology uh, works and how it, it ends up being related by Rasmussen to get a nice invariant. Next slide, please. That's just some abstract material. The way it's done is by comparing the gradings and getting uh, an invariant by looking, starting with Lee cycles and comparing them with that. Next slide please. And then here's a, um, a bullet list of how it works, how it looks. You have the Rasmussen invariant 
in the integers. It's additive under connected sum. It behaves nicely on mirror images. And if you have a positive knot diagram, then it's actually equal to twice the cipher genus, what we were seeing before. And if you have a torus knot, you get A minus one times B minus one if it's an AB torus knot and so on. So, um, so that's how that works by this comparison and by this wonderful fortuitous situation that the Lee homology is directly related to the cipher surfaces of the knots. Everything works very well for positive knots because of that cycle is way up in a place where it's definitely non-trivial. It can't be hit by anybody in the homology. When you look at non-positive knots and try to do the same thing, then it's case by case because you have to think about the cycles in the Lee homology and whether or not they got hit by somebody. But they're all constructed in this ciphered way. So I hope that gives you a, a picture of uh, what the uh, this um, uh, Kravana homology and Lee homology background looks like. Next slide, please. So now I want to jump to a little comment. I'm jumping way back to phenomenology now. Um, this is an experiment by Alexienko, uh, which was shown to me by Renzo a few years ago. And it's a very beautiful experiment. And, and in his experiment, using vortices in a turbine, so he has a big turbine wider at the bottom than it is at the top. Water is being rotated. You have a line vortex going down the turbine. And uh, the, that means that the, the, the vortex line can kind of float upward. Um, and it floats upward and undergoes a reconnection and produces a link. So we went backwards and got some topology. This is exactly the kind of thing I was pre presenting as a question. Could this happen? And it does happen in Alexienko's experiment. So maybe even more uh, topology could happen in his experiments. Here's, a, here's what his pictures look like. Next slide. Uh, that's a picture of the vortex in the turbine. See how it's wider at the bottom. Next slide. Um, here it's beginning to come up. We're just looking at stills. Next slide. Slid underneath itself. Next slide. Getting up a little farther. Next slide. Now you begin to see it's getting close to itself over there near the top. Next slide. Now you will note that if you put an arrow on that vortex, it's heading on down and then winds around and come back up. So it's possible for a reconnection to happen where you see it seemingly about to happen. Next slide. Indeed, it's pulling in. And in this movie, I don't have any details of the reconnection. There are some other movies <coughs> due to Alexienko where you see the beautiful beautiful interactions and filaments going between the vortex lines and many other phenomena that beg for understanding. But anyway, next slide. And the reconnection has happened and there's the link. Next slide. A little, another moment later. So that's uh, really fascinating, I think, uh, uh, to uh, contemplate uh, since it is a reality that you can produce non-trivial topological configurations from trivial ones under certain circumstances. Next slide. Uh, that's a summary of what happened for Alexienko. And next slide, here's some science fiction. We can imagine the following scenario occurring in his chamber. Three curls and one of them gets up near another and you produce a link like he did. And then the other curl comes up and uh, interacts with that and you get a truffle mount. I don't see why that couldn't happen in Alexienko's chamber. I think we have to communicate with him and ask him if he could make it happen. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's the end. Thank you very much.